Hi, I'm Corey Nathan, and this is Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. Your home for edifying, provocative, and fun conversations among high profile public figures and regular folks like me. We talk about faith and politics and all kinds of topics that really matter in our culture. So if you're tired of all the screamers out there taking all the oxygen out of the room and you want to join us and taking some of that space back, you'll love talking politics and religion without killing each other. Thanks for spending some time with us. Enjoy today's show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're just diving right back in today. This is part two of our talk with Mike Madrid and Chuck Rocha. We got to hear a lot from Chuck on part one of this conversation. And we're picking it right back where Mike hopped in. And uh, I, I think you'll enjoy what we have to say. Before we get started, I'd love to just appeal to you. We rely on your support to make these conversations happen. So would you consider becoming one of our patrons? Every bit counts. It's real easy. Just go to politicsandreligion.us. That's politicsandreligion.us and click on that patron app. The, uh, the There's a button at the top and it'll really help us continue what we're doing, such as talking to Mike Madrid and Chuck Roach and all kinds of other great guests. Just great people talk about faith and politics and big ideas in our culture. Yeah. So here's part two of our conversation with Chuck Rocha and Mike Madrid. I just started talking about money and Mike Madrid showed up. That's how it normally happens. <laughs> like we're 45 minutes into the conversation of Mike Madrid. I think, I think he overheard or had like that spidey sense that we were, we were figuring out all the ways that Mike Madrid's got it all wrong. I've been talking so much shit on Mike Madrid. I got to clean everything up now. I just came Ooh. to clarify everything, all the misinformation you've been hearing for the last 45 minutes, folks. So don't worry. I'm here. We're going to clear it all up for you. Oh, my God. <laughs> and for all of you that's listening, what I said about math and about how much better looking I am than him and smarter than him and all the ways I had beat his ass in every election, know that he's, he's not going to be telling you the truth if he says anything <laughs> other than that. All right. So, Mike, uh, wait, let me give you a proper intro. Yes. Uh, folks, remember you from from uh, you were on the program last year, but Mike Madrid, national political strategist, expert in demographics and Latino politics. Uh, Mike's academic work on Latino politics became the foundation for groundbreaking communications and outreach strategies in California, Texas, Florida and nationwide. Later, Mike was a co-founder of the Lincoln Project, which played a, a, a significant part in defeating Donald Trump, but only after thoroughly annoying Trump with their hard hitting ads, which I loved. Uh, Mike also lectures on race, class, and partisanship at USC, and he's a regular contributor to one of my favorite programs, Politicology, with Ron Steslow, where he has become known, and we already referenced it here, Mike, I eat numbers for breakfast Madrid, uh, <laughs> and again, we, we've been talking quite a bit about the, the excellent and timely new podcast, Latino Vote, that my co-host with Chuck Rocha, who we've been getting to know really well. Mike, good to see you, man. It's so great to be with both of you. I appreciate it. My apologies for being so late on this, but you were obviously in good hands with Chuck. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Mike, so uh, you've been, uh, we, we've been tuning in on, on all the things that you've been talking about on the Latino Vote podcast. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to give you this uh, open floor to uh, tell us where Chuck has it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. Well, yeah, Easy. I'll go slow. <laughs> L look, um, Chuck and I began a conversation, um, you know, as as the uh, primaries were kind of winding down in the 2020 election cycle. And um, I've been admiring his work from afar for a long time. It's very rare for political consultants to kind of reach across the aisle like, like this. Um, but neither of us were involved, obviously, in the Biden campaign, but we were both concerned about the direction of the country because of our expertise, we had a real keen understanding and we've got this great insight into, into the dynamics of these, these larger campaigns and the Hispanic Latino vote. And, and so we, we reached out to each other. I don't remember how it started, but uh, we, we started this conversation. And I, I, it was great for me because I got to ask, you know, th this guy who's done things in the Latino community that has never been done before. Um, you, how'd you do it? What, what was going on? What made you guys make this decision back in the 2016 cycle? You know, are the Democrats doing this for this reason or for that reason? And here's what I see the Republicans doing. And it was kind of like two generals, you know, from opposing armies coming in and, and being able to talk about 
these battle plans, not just for the 2020 cycle and for the future, but, but in the past too. And, and as Chuck will tell you, we probably don't agree on much in, from an issues perspective, but we really admire each other's uh, approach to campaigns. Uh, and he does things as a Democrat that I have never seen Democrats do before. The, the turnout that Chuck has been able to produce is unprecedented. In fact, I used to rely on the lack of turnout and the lack of Democratic turnout operations to win a lot of my campaigns. And then, then Chuck kind of really started coming on the scene nationally and started um, turning things around with the Nevada caucuses uh, going back to 2016, certainly 2022. Um, the numbers in Texas start looking a lot different. And then California kind of blows the doors off of everybody with turnout. And, you know, for years, I was saying that the turnout numbers, that there's just no way the Democrats can do this. I've heard labor unions saying they could get higher turnout. I've seen millions of dollars in statewide contests spent by Republicans and Democrats. Nobody could do it. And then this Texan shows up and he he does it. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, to 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 inflate Chuck's ego too much because, you know, he's got this hat collection. His head gets too big. These hats won't fit easy, on his head anymore. Easy, gosh, damn it. But, but I, <laughs> I am, I, I do admire, I do admire your work as a practitioner. And we decided after the 2020 cycle, because we were both saying, guys, there's a problem. There's a, there's a problem. And, and, and Chuck was saying that, and I was saying that, and it was interesting to see kind of a Republican and Democrat who've done campaigns at the highest levels in the country saying, Hey, there's, there's problems. There's, this is what's going to happen. And then being right. We just decided, you know what, let's just have this conversation on air. Let's talk about it. And it, it, it is in the weeds. It, it is a, a practitioner's dialogue. Um, but if you want to learn um, f- from the bottom up, how, how this needs to change, if we're going to move the country in a different direction with this explosive Latino vote that is happening that is now determinative in races like Georgia and Wisconsin and Virginia. Um, it's not just the California, Texas thing anymore, like when Chuck and I were, were, were younger guys. Um, it's everywhere and it's getting bigger and every election cycle it's growing and it's going to change um, the way our politics in this country uh, work. Every cycle it's going to get bigger and change more and more states in play, more and more House seats in play, more and more Senate and congressional gubernatorial races in play. And we've got 30 years, you know, each of us uh, doing this uh, successfully. And we've got a lot of stories, a lot of anecdotes, a lot of examples. We, we share the, the experiences of the races that we're working on right now and what works. And um, we also point out very clearly the mistakes that are being made in both of our parties because we've seen it up close. That's something you're not going to hear from other consultants. And, and one of the things that I think is really valuable about this Latino Vote podcast is Chuck and I, we're, we're too damn old and we built our businesses around uh, <laughs> Chuck's nodding his head. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, the barriers around our businesses because we were not, we did not get the opportunities that other white consultants got. And we were not, we had, we had to build our businesses around that, and so we're not really beholden to to to, to kind of the establishment in either parties. And we know what we're talking about, and we we say that, and we're very comfortable calling out the party when it's wrong, and the leadership when it's wrong, and the establishment when it's wrong, and and being honest about it without us trying to you know procure anything other than having our parties both respective parties doing the right thing on behalf of the community so a long way of saying in many ways i think it's probably a professional fulfillment for both of us we're both at a point in our career where we can be very earnest and open and direct and be both critical and supportive where we need to be uh, as well as provide a hell of a lot of insight and it's just been a lot of fun to learn from from probably the only other person who's done the races, Latino races at this level. And, um, and it's exciting. It's good stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously there's going to be a lot of policy differences and tactical differences, as you described, Mike, uh, your lifelong Republican and Chuck has been working on democratic policy politics since he's a, he's a boy. But I think one thing from listening to you both that you share in common is an understanding. And I'd love for you to share with us your perspective on What's at stake in this next election and then in the, in the cycle after that? We call that the Mike Madrid windup for all you scoring at home. If you listen to the Latino vote podcast, just so you know, he'll answer the question at the end of that windup, but he winds up like he is a submarine pitcher with the LA Dodger. But I'll also say that Mike is also, cause Mike is so connected to us and we've gotten so good at talking is that uh, what I laid out before Mike got on about the, uh, about the, there's no access point 
for folks like me and Mike in campaigns. There are more access points now and they're still very limited. So what Mike just said about me and him being just, if I was to, not, I don't have a wind up, I will just pretty much tell you what he's saying is, is there's people would be scared to death to say the shit that me and Mike will say, because they have to still get work from the parties and that we are taking the bullets for all those young operatives right now that don't need to take the bullets who should be lined up to get that work because our job is to make sure there's more access to that power and money for dis for all kinds of folks in both parties will make us a better democracy yeah. i will debate mike madrid all day and twice on sundays about the best path to get latino entrepreneurship and opportunity for our community and we'll disagree but what we will end up being is wanting more opportunity. And let's have that robust debate about how we get there. That makes us a better democracy. What's at stake in this election with no wind up is that there's more congressional, Senate and gubernatorial races where Latinos will make the difference than almost any other election cycle in the history of American politics. People talk about the sleeping giant with Latinos, which is a misnomer. Latinos are not sleeping we're not a giant. We're a big part of the demographic that's walking right down Main Street right now going, if you don't pay attention to us, you're going to be at your own behest because we're going to be the difference in California 27, in California 22, in Colorado 8, in Texas 15, in New Mexico 2, in the Arizona Senate race, in the Nevada Senate race, in the Georgia Senate race, in the Florida Senate race, in the New Mexican governor's race, and in local municipality elections all over the country. And if you listen to the Latino Vote podcast and combine the Madrid eating numbers for breakfast with <laughs> Chuck Roach's storytelling, then you can, we will tell you how to go out and at least have an opportunity to win that vote. Because no matter if they're conservative or liberal or moderate, there's a commonality within our culture that brings us together where we're Mexican, Puerto Rican, or Cuban. That's different, but they're still rooted in a common struggle and a younger demographic who are all aspiring to become and realize the American dream. And I think that's, what's most at stake. That was moving top that shit, Madrid. I'm voting for <laughs> Chuck. I don't know what he's running for dog catcher probably, but he's got my vote <laughs> after that. speech. I, I will say this. Um, I, I think and look, and, and, and Chuck is exactly right. And again, a lot of what you're going to get from listening to us is going through all of those races which clearly show, um, and we will be talking about each one of those races, by the way, as we head up into the midterms and what the Latino vote means and how they're different in each one. Um, but at, at stake literally is uh, the balance of power, um, both in the House of Representatives, who controls Congress, um, the, the party that understands the Latino vote better, I think is going to be um, best positioned to win control of the House, and also the statewide contest that he mentions, and I'll throw in Arizona as well too, which is really important because of the Secretary of State's races. In, in Georgia, where the Latino vote was decisive, and Arizona, where the Latino vote's decisive, uh, in Nevada, where the Latino votes can be decisive on electing secretaries of state that will actually be counting and certifying ballots in the 2024 presidential race, which is kind of the, the backgrounder here, the backdrop for all of this. But, but there is something even larger at stake, and that is this. Uh, America has never been a non-white European country. Uh, that is going to change, not majority country. Um, the, the largest ethnic plurality by the time, you know, we're all you know, ready to, to, to cash our checks and cash in the chips, um, meaning next 25, 30 years, Latin American, people of Latin, Latino descent will be the largest ethnic plurality in this country. And that has huge impacts on the way democracy is practiced, and it has huge impacts on the way our very own American identity is perceived. And both parties at this current time are doing a few things right, and they're doing a whole lot of things wrong. And a lot of these shifts that are happening between the parties are really happening despite themselves. And that's where we really, I think, um, take a look under the hood and start explaining what this actually means. This, this demographic change is unprecedented. America has never gone through the demographic changes we are currently experiencing now. And we're watching it manifest every election cycle when it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the Democrats have this old playbook that isn't working anymore. And the Republicans are realizing they've got to develop a playbook because they thought they could just ignore it forever. And both of those um, don't, are not sufficient to kind of accommodate what is going to be happening. And answering the, the, that question, Corey, is really important, I think, for me, because 
even as, as a young man um, in, the, in the early mid 1990s, just looking at the math over the trajectory of my lifetime, it was clear that America, the whole idea of America and American democracy was going to change as Latinos become the largest ethnic plurality. This is a people that are, are foundationally, fundamentally, culturally different and distinct than the white Europeans who established the idea of America. And that's not anything to be afraid of. It's something to, I think, embrace and really challenge whether or not the American experiment can expand into what it originally promised to be on paper. We've never, we've never really lived up to that, obviously, as in reality, but we, we, we've talked about these universal ideas of, of what all of us have as inalienable rights, even though we have fallen very, very short of that in reality and in practice. We're going to really be testing the case uh, over the course of the next two decades. And Latinos are going to be, I think, the bridge to those two different Americas, a, a pre-multiracial, um, multi-ethnic democracy and a post-multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy. And if Latinos can hold the reins of that and carry that torch forward, in many ways, I think we really become much closer to what the promise of America originally was. And that's just really exciting, I think, to watch unfold on a daily basis and race by race bring up some great points. You know, I'd love to, I know that every district is unique. Every Latino voter is unique, but uh, Mike, since I, I know you grew up in a district just adjacent to California 27 mm -hmm. and Chuck, uh, Chuck did a, a deep dive on, on California 27. I'd love to uh, ask a five, Chuck was just sharing some, some of his insights about this district, mm -hmm. but I'd love to um, ask about you know, a lot of folks assume that immigration is the leading issue for Latino voters. Right. Uh, but polling here generally shows otherwise. What did you find to be issues that motivate Latino voters, it, whether it's specific to California 27 or more broadly? Well, uh, look, there's 30 years of evidence, 30 years of polling saying that jobs and the economy are the top issue. And as I've argued, um, I think quite effectively, um, the Latino voter, really the best way to characterize it, and, and, and we need to characterize it as, as you know, our media ne needs to say, what's the silver bullet here? They're not much, our media isn't much for nuance, um, but, but, but it's a very nuanced change that is happening. But if you look at the Latino voter, as we looked at the Reagan Democrats in the 1980s, that is a essentially a socially conservative blue collar working class, you, you'll get a real firm understanding of what is happening, this demographic shift that Reagan essentially um, moved along this realignment process. These are people that are registered as Democrats. They come from Democratic households with a habit of voting like Democrats, but they're blue collar. This is, this is the people who work with their hands for a living. That is why I would argue, and I you know, wrote this piece in the New York Times, basically arguing that what we're really witnessing is a, is a shift between college educated, non-college educated workforces. And the interesting about this congressional seat, Corey, that you're in and that I grew up in and did my first congressional races in and that Chuck was talking about is you actually have a higher number of college educated voters, including Latino suburban uh, voters. In fact, Congressman Mike Garcia is a perfect embodiment of that. He's the, he's the son of immigrants, went to a military academy and has now moved his political leanings have moved to the right. It's a very typical acculturation process. It's not unlike the friends and neighbors that I grew up with because that's the neighborhood I, neighborhoods I grew up in. And it, what it, I think, signifies, um, and, and in fact, as Chuck correctly pointed out, with the exception of the Valadeo seat uh, in California, uh, the, the two congressional seats in Orange County and the Mike Garcia seat, those three seats have among the highest number of college graduates of any congressional districts held by Republicans in the country. And, and the more education you have, the more discerning you become as a voter. And it's why they tend to be moving more towards the Democratic Party. That's problematic for Garcia. He just lost Simi Valley portion of the district. He's in deep trouble. He probably doesn't survive this election cycle. And I think that that seat will go to, uh, toward, to the Democrats this election cycle, in part because of college-educated uh, Latinos who are buying homes out in the suburbs and defying kind of this stereotype that it is only immigration issues that we are, you know, concerned about. 
Um, if, if you're in David Valadeo's seat in the Central Valley, immigration is a much bigger concern because the, the workforce there is almost entirely, you know, agriculturally based. And there's a lot of uh, immigrants um, that are looking for a, a redress on those issues. That is not the case in the Santa Clarita Valley in California at all. These are voters, again, that are, are basically equivalent to their to their college educated white peers who live next door. And so this the immigration issue is not helpful in terms of connecting with Latino voters at all, this, the way other issues are that are resonant with non-Hispanic whites. I'm Brian Kaler, the award-winning podcast host of Dangerous Dogma, the authority on questioning authority. If you're a fan of Joel Olstein, Paula White, or John MacArthur, then this is not the show for you. On Dangerous Dogma, we challenge dangerous teachings found in various strands of Christianity while also taking seriously Jesus' own teachings that lead us into dangerous places. Listen wherever you get your podcast or at dogma.wordandway.org. That's so interesting because I know one of the most motivating factors for me to uh, switch my vote to a Democratic candidate has to do with this, um, with the election, with democracy itself. Mm-hmm. You know, M- Mike gave me a little bit of hope, but Garcia gave me a little bit of hope when he didn't sign on to that amicus brief came, that came out of the Texas AG. Mm-hmm. But then the, the, the night of January 6th, he's voting to overturn Pennsylvania's election. And his, his reasoning for that is just a bunch of talking points. He doesn't even know the issue well enough to know why he voted against democracy itself. But Chuck, I'll let you respond to that. What, what issues motivate latino voters whether it's california 27 or more broadly it, latinos aren't that much different than the general population when it comes to this it's how you ask that question and as i said earlier before mike got on all posters start with what issue is the most important to you over the why you're going to go vote and latinos maybe even more so because we're a younger more newly to this country demographic is it's always jobs in the economy and the way that the posters ask. And then it's also always like education and healthcare. It's those three, but the white voters are a lot in that way. Immigration uh, is higher in Democrats uh, polling ends up being four or five or six, but it's the way we use these, these issues, right? Like people say that we should that Latinos don't just care about immigration. They care about jobs in the economy. Of course we do, because Mike just told you that they're workers and they work with their hands and they're more uh, reliant on the work to rely on, you know, getting to the next rung of the socioeconomic ladder. I can't believe I just said that with Mike here, but the socioeconomic (laughs) ladder. But I would also say this is that I feel like we're scared of immigration as well. And Democratic consultants are scared that Republicans are going to say we're open border and that we're this and we're Title 42, when we should lean in, in my opinion, on our immigrant story. There's so many of us who have that story and there's long, you know, stories in California that there are a lot of those Mexican families who are buying those houses out in the suburbs whose grandparents were immigrants to California through lots of different programs that the government probably sponsored. So we shouldn't be scared to talk about the success stories of immigration instead of just running and hiding behind a column because a Republican thinks that you're going to be pro open borders or some shit they made up. Yeah. Um, So real quick production note, Chuck, you said uh, 3 PM Eastern is your heart out. Yes. Okay. Uh, Okay. So I I might, Mike, I might keep you here for a little bit after Chuck takes off so you can, you, you yeah, can, you want to bring the strongest voice out to close anyway. So we're good. <laughs> oh my God. I have pitched eight solid innings. Solid oh innings. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Chuck, before you take off, I want you to tell us about season two of Nuestro podcast coming up uh, here, coming up this summer. Yeah. So this summer we're, we did a first season last year, which is much different than the Latino vote podcast, where we take stories of Latinos from all over the country and highlight their immigration story, what we just talked about and their success stories, Latino business owners, Latino activists, uh, even Latino senators, Mike, I got uh, Senator Alex Padilla. I interviewed him last year. This year, we're going to expand that to do more stories around Uh, I dig into cultural differences between young Latinos and old Latinos, Latinos who've been in prison, who've just got out. We talked about my criminal record and me and some of the stories that I've been doing here in D.C. and talk about what incarceration is like and how that's affected the Latino community. So it's a much culturally 
deeper podcast that I couldn't do with Mike Madrid because he's neither cultural or deep when it comes to these things. <laughs> so if you want to hear the numbers, you come to the Latino vote. If you come, if you want to hear some charming rhetoric around our community, then you it's the Latino Nuestro podcast. And I appreciate you not giving me crap about uh, how I'm pronouncing them, this, some of the Spanish words here. Yo trato uh, de aprender español. So uh, I, I can only I can only do my best. Well, at least your English is better than mine because I don't speak either language very good. <laughs> well, I'm just glad we got the explicit check mark before we had you on, Chuck. So you, you, you can be you here. So, uh, But before you take off, let us know how can we find you and uh, Nuestro Podcast and uh, Solidarity Strategies and all the great work that you're doing online. All of those things are on the Twitters at Chuck Rocha, at Nuestro Podcast, at Solidarity Strategies. We appreciate everybody who comes on. And, and really, the Latino Vote Podcast that Mike's going to close up with here is also a big deal. There's not really been anything like this. Not Very rarely do you get Democrats or Republicans coming together to talk about issues in the community. So make sure that you register and that you follow the Latino Vote Podcast as well. Michael, hit you up. Register. Make sure you're following it. Uh, we want to grow this and continue it long beyond between now and the election but i can bet your ass between now and november we're going to piss a lot of people off and talk a lot about things that need to be talked about in our community to make sure our community has all the representation that it can deserve and last question before you go did you have any questions for me i was wondering when you get ready to go work out and jump on the treadmill what's the first song that's going to come on your phone that you have downloaded oh man so i my usual go-to is um some hard rocking live version that uh, Blues Traveler does. Uh, I'm on a I'm on a Blues Traveler kick because Popper, uh, one of my John Popper, best harmonica player in the world for my money. Uh, he actually uh, did us a huge solid and came on our program. And even though he's a musician, he was very uh, very cool about talking about politics and religion. So I I'm going to give them some love and say that that that's my go to when I'm uh, starting to work. But I haven't worked out in a while, so as you could tell, uh, so. <laughs> Well, thanks for having, thanks for having Mike on. He is my spiritual, spiritual advisor. So he'll be giving all my religious content for the rest of the podcast. Fair enough. Thank you, <laughs> Sensei. Talk to y'all later. See you, you bet, Chuck. Good talking to you. All right. Now we can, now we can have all the real information, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> He's great. Chuck's great to work with. Oh, it's great getting to know him. Uh, love talking to him. I, I appreciate you introducing us. Yeah. Now there's something that you've talked about a couple of times, Mike, that I wanted to, I wanted to have you flesh that out here. Uh, Chuck and I were talking a little bit about polls mm -hmm. and in particular to, with uh, regard to Latino voters, yeah. there's something amiss there. A couple of things that you mentioned in particular sample size, yeah. as well as when we're factoring in California's uh, Latino voters, as opposed to looking at the rest of the country. Can you flesh that out a little bit for us? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's really one of the biggest challenges to understanding whatever this quote unquote Latino vote is. So the first is, well, let me talk about sample size. And then when I'm done that, you know, bring, bring me back into the California exception, because I think it's one of the greatest untold stories in politics that's happening right now and will define kind of our national politics for the next decade or so. So sample size is very important. And what most people don't understand is even though there's about 180 million uh, Americans of voting age population, eligible voting age population, we can look at that $180 million, uh, $180 million voters scientifically with a sample size of about 1,000 people. And that captures the different gradations of age, gender, geography, ethnicity, race, um, income levels to give us a, a scientifically valid sample of what the other 180 million uh, people think. And again, this is a, this is, this is, there's a science to this. This is, this is scientific data engaging public opinion. And while there are variations, there's obviously variations in science, we continue to kind of refine what it is that we're doing. The challenge with the Latino vote as it's growing, and because of the diversity in the community, is if you accept the fact, uh, as you should, that about 11% of the population is currently Hispanic, then of that 1,000 people that you're polling, about 110 people are uh, of Hispanic descent. Now, scientifically, you can come up with a valid statistical model of a thousand people to represent that 180 million. But when you shrink down to 110, you have a larger um, margin of error, considerably larger. Um, in fact, it's probably 10 or 15 points, maybe even bigger. In other words, you can't really do a poll of 110 people to get a sample size of 25, 30 million Hispanics. It just doesn't work out mathematically that way. 
So even though it worked for the larger sample to get a snapshot of America, you're not getting an accurate gauge of the sampling of Hispanics. Are you following me? Yeah. Does this make sense? So what happens with most of these polls that you see is um, these sample sizes are so small that they lead to extraordinarily wide variations, plus or minus 10 points. So you could have one poll that's scientific and legitimate that says Latinos voted for X candidate to the tune of 40%. And another poll with the exact same methodology saying that same candidate only got 20%. They're both statistically valid for the larger pool, but are misnomers and inaccurate with the smaller sample size. So the way you would correct for that is to do a survey or a poll of just Hispanics. And I think and I hope a lot of national pollsters are going to be, start doing that because these small sample sizes are leading to very, very misleading data points that are wildly inaccurate and they are used by partisans on both sides to advance a political agenda when they're not really scientifically sound. So when you were looking at Hispanic voter opinion, sample size is everything. And the way we are um, just pulling out these small sample sizes out of larger voting pools is leading to very, again, misleading data that is just often flat wrong or is, has such wide variations in the results as to render it essentially useless it's a big problem. It's something I've been very critical of um, for, for some time, and I hope that it will be corrected. My guess is uh, while they are slow to accommodate those changes, most national pollsters uh, will get it pretty, uh, pretty soon and hopefully in time for the midterms. But if not, I'm, I'm assuming they'll probably get it right uh, heading into the 2024 election cycle. Now, a lot of folks, who, uh, the other part of that question is the California part of the problem is a lot of folks are seeing the numbers nationwide and have reason to be concerned, but you're saying take California out of the equation and you have that much more reason to be concerned. So can you describe that uh, factor? Yeah, this is really important. And it goes back to this idea that Democrats have had for a couple of decades now, which is that just demographics alone would help them pick up and maintain a majority because the Hispanic population was moving so fast. And the idea that they would ba we would basically California is that the right word? California would be a precursor of what was going to happen in the rest of the country, because as, as California became more Hispanic, more Latino, it became more solidly Democrat and it marginalized the Republican Party. The idea was that as Latinos started to grow throughout the country, the same thing would happen, but it has not. And uh, further, because so many Latinos live in California, when you wait a poll and waiting, basically W-E-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, -I -I waiting, is where you put the number of balance of Hispanics from your subsample in, uh, you have to have a, an overweighting in California because that's where most Hispanics live. Does that make sense? Am I clear on that? So far, yeah. Okay. So the, 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 one of the anomalies about California is that it is the uh, bluest state, probably arguably in the nation, certainly the largest, the, the, the bluest large state in the union. And the Hispanic demographic here is overwhelmingly Democrat or votes for Democrats. And it's remarkably consistent. And this is important. I know it's a little bit in the weeds, but follow me here. California has, again, the largest Hispanic population by a wide measure. It has the most Democratic uh, population of Hispanic Democrats by wide measure. And so 75%, fully 75% of Hispanics in California vote for the Democrat. And they have consistently for a couple of decades. So um, now I'm going to run you through the a litany of the last three election cycles to illustrate how significant the Democrats' problem is nationally. Uh, Barack Obama got 71% of the Hispanic vote in 2012. In California, he got 75% of the vote which is where about uh, 40, 50% of Hispanics live. Hillary Clinton, four years later, got about 65, 66% of the Hispanic vote, dropped about six points. Uh, she got 75%, the exact same number out of California, even though uh, the, her numbers dropped nationally so significantly that uh, she ended up with 69% in the country. Fast forward again, four years to 2020, Joe Biden gets 59% of the Hispanic vote. In California, he gets 75, the exact same number. So what that means is the Hispanic vote outside of California is dropping at such a precipitous rate for Democrats that California is masking 
the actual demographic and political transition that is occurring. Is, is that clear? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you bet the fact that it is the largest uh, Latino population and that number has stayed 75%, it means that the fact that we've gone from 71% to uh, 65, 66% to 59%. It means that the rest of the country is even worse than that. That's exactly right. By a wide measure, because the, the numbers in California are so disproportionate that the numbers that Democrats are getting are reflective, overwhelmingly reflective of the California electorate, which is staying solidly blue in a state that is solidly blue. It's arguable that those votes really don't count much because California is going to go blue anyway. So the rest of the Hispanic electorate is dropping at such a fast rate that it is it's pulling down even the strong weighted tendency that is the California Hispanic vote. You characterize it perfectly with what's going on. So when you start to hear about these shifts that are happening in in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, in Virginia, in New York, in New Jersey with the off cycle elections uh, in Wisconsin, in, uh, in Georgia, uh, uh, it, it, everywhere, with the exception of Arizona and California, this dramatic shift is occurring, and it should be setting off a five alarm bell for the Democrats because the problem is much, much greater than they, uh, than even the national polling suggests, because the problem is happening in non-blue California to a much greater degree than anywhere else. It's interesting because it sounds like part of the problem is that there is a lot of strategists and and folks who are paying attention to this kind of thing have are looking through the lens that they want to look through they, exactly. they it's like an a priori uh way to approach these numbers and I, you know it's funny because i saw that i made the mistake of reading a bunch of the comments to your new york times piece that came out a, a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and it, 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 it's almost like i don't care about the numbers right uh, because i already decided what i want the, the facts to be, regardless of what the actual facts are, you know, exactly. so you're getting crap thrown at you from folks that didn't like the actual facts. Yeah, it's all it's and I, I, I have not read that, but I, I will take a look at it now. I, I actually never even saw the uh, op ed on the New York Times page. But what I will say is the, the syndrome that affects kind of the Trump voter, which is when you see numbers you don't like, you immediately attack the poll and then you start to blame the media for fooling people, because clearly that can't be the case and then doubling down on the fact that your party or your candidate cannot be making mistakes those three characteristics are descriptive of both sides um, they both do it and it's it's horrifying for the, the the practice of democracy and it's it is just as bad on the left as it is on the right i know a lot of your viewers probably aren't going to or your listeners are not going to like hearing that but it's absolutely true, and you're, you're making the case for it, is if I don't like what a poll says, uh, immediately I attack the poll, then I blame the media, and then I double down on the fact that my guy can't be making a mistake. I mean, if that doesn't sound like Trumpism, I don't know what is, but that's the exact same dynamic that are happening with Biden voters and, and, and Democratic voters at this time. And what it does is rather than allow you to look at something scientific, and that's the irony, it's science. Polling is a science. OK, just the same way, you know, uh, um, dealing with covid was a science. If you're denying science, there's that's a that's a red flag. That's a problem. Um, you, you can't address the underlying problem. And the irony is this is all very fixable for Democrats. They are just refusing to acknowledge a problem and saying, well, that can't possibly be. You can't possibly be right because we are smarter, more virtuous, more correct on the right side of history, whatever language you want to use. And that's a problem endemic to both sides is this refusal to acknowledge that there are course corrections that they need to be made. But it's also why there's such a huge opportunity with the Latino vote for the party that finally figures it out and is willing to adjust, learn and pick up these votes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the New York Times piece. But mm -hmm. before we do, so we're, we're beginning to get a, a little bit of a diagnosis of some of the problem. But what is some of the prescription? What can be done better? Whether it's, you know, and, and listen, I'm still somewhat agnostic. So in my district, it would be, it, it is a binary choice. It's either Christy Smith, I, I think she'll be the Democratic nominee or reelecting Mike Garcia. But there's other choices like in Georgia, I think it's Georgia 14, is that MTGs? Yeah. The, the, a Democrat's not going to get elected there. So, so there are a few Republican candidates that look a lot more like a John Katko or, or Adam Kitzinger. The Adam Kinzingers of the world that mm -hmm. that 
you, you know, so I, listen, let's get behind some some true conservatives, some some real uh, principled conservatives. But what can be done better in order to uh, protect our democracy? That at the end of the day, I'm for pro democracy. Whether you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, I'm for pro democracy candidates. Yeah. So you mean just generally or with the Hispanic vote specifically or both? let's talk about specifically with Hispanic votes? Well, again, the, 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 the Democratic Party really has to recognize something and it has a reckoning that it has not come to, to, to terms with. Uh, the Democratic Party is not the party of the working class in America. Let me say that again, because this is really shocking and jarring to Democrats. The Democratic Party is not the party of the working class. That is not Mike Madrid saying that. That is the working class saying that with the way that they're voting. OK, the, the fastest changing um, political dynamic in the country today is the consolidation between college educated voters who are moving dramatically towards the Democratic Party and um, and non-college educated voters that are moving equally dramatically towards the Republican Party. The blue collar worker in America is a Republican. You can argue about whose policies are right or wrong. I, it's not my expertise. My expertise is understanding voting behavior and working class voters are saying unequivocally the Republican Party represents their interests and that is who they are voting for. So until the Democratic Party gets back to its FDR roots, its working class roots, its hard hat roots, which is why where Chuck came up as a union organizer, right? That's where he started as a union guy. That's especially in the construction trades, the building trades, people who work for a living with their hands. That is the, the, the Republican Party is the party of the working man now. OK, until Democrats get a, a greater awareness of that and adjust to that, they are going to continue to isolate themselves on issues that are not of consequence to 65 percent of the American voter. 65% of American voters do not have a college degree. So when you talk about going fishing where the fish are, the Democrats are not fishing where the fish are. They're, they're isolating their vote with 35% of the electorate. And that's a huge problem, okay? So finding those voters on, uh, on the Republican side of the aisle who are very much engaged in a cultural war is increasingly difficult because they feel and I, 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 you know, right or wrong, again, I'm not here to make a judgment on that. I'm just here to talk about, about the, the, the activity of uh, the behavior of voters. They believe that if they are to lose these cultural issues, it doesn't matter whether you have America or, or a balance of powers or, you know, these different institutions that we've built up anyway, because America is not worth saving. And that's, that's scary because that's, that's literally where we are at here in 2022 heading into the midterms. And again, the Democratic Party is, has got a really, really difficult road to hoe here because it needs to address in, in its own mind some of the existential threats of things like climate change and environmental collapse. At the same time, they need to start promoting and working with blue collar industries like energy production, the construction trades and manufacturing, because people in those industries who are overwhelmingly Latino and growing more and more Latino every day, this is the new future of the blue collar workforce, view the Democratic Party as the enemy of those jobs. They view those, the Democratic Party as the enemy of the working class. And until Democrats understand that, they're really not gonna be competitive in places and states and regions where they're going to need to be. And that's gonna create some greater instability in our democracy as one party that is not as committed to democracy wins and continues to, to, to see victories in places that give them a complete lock on the Electoral College and arguably even control of Congress. Through that framework, it makes sense that the infrastructure bill, uh, the in infrastructure law that passed last fall was able to be a bipartisan one. But the, um, <laughs> I don't know if the Democrats are necessarily parlaying that victory, uh, but from what you're saying, it sounds like they really should be. Because that 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 would win them some votes from this uh, this populist, not just Latino vote, but the blue collar vote that they, uh, they they've been losing over the last few cycles. It might, but I, I really don't. I think it will have marginal results. And again, it's a very democratic way of thinking to be like, oh well, we passed this bill and governments did this big thing, mm -hmm. and this bill is going to help you. When really, what they're saying is that's great, but I don't believe anything that comes out of Washington. 
Jen, I just don't want you shutting down the factory that I work in. Mm. I just don't, I don't want you, you know, I make $90,000 a year in the oil patch in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, I can afford uh, my mortgage. I can save for my kid's college education. And I can even, you know, maybe take a vacation with my family. Um, I would prefer that than this bill that you're spending that I don't even know what it is. So Democrats, I think, have this tendency to be like, well, to, to believe that success comes through government action. And it's not that Hispanics or working class people are anti-government per se. It's just not real to them. It's a very abstract notion that somehow something happening in Washington, D.C., some Build Back Better program or some infrastructure program is going to come in and, and increase their lives. It may, it may not. But the real connection is, is showing up to work every day and making sure that the owners of this company or the management in this company aren't saying we're going to have to shut down another 30 jobs because we can't keep up with these regulations anymore. Um, so the Democrats in Congress are, are killing us. That's the difference. That's the distinction. And look, I think, I think the legislation was, was good. I think it could be very, very helpful. It's certainly important for the country. We've needed to get an infrastructure bill done for the past 40 years. Biden finally gets it done. It's definitely a feather in his cap. Is that what voters are going to be, blue collar working class voters are going to be thinking about when they head into the voting booth? No, not very likely, very de minimis, um, especially when they view, view much larger threats to their industry and their income and their livelihoods coming from the Democratic Party. I do. Since you're on, I have to tell you that I've shamelessly stolen that phrase, de minimis. It's become one of my favorite phrases. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but but you, what you're talking about, you dealt with in, in that piece that I, I referred to that came out in the New York Times. It's called While Democrats Debate Latinx. I don't even know if that's how you say it. Yeah. While Democrats Debate Latinx, Latinos head to the GOP. Got a lot of buzz. Uh, like I, I alluded to already, it, it raised a lot of eyebrows. So can we talk about that for a second? Sure. What, uh, where, where are you coming from with that? Well, and again, I think it's really important to, to understand that we are in this era of negative partisanship. And what that means is people are voting more against things than they are voting for things. And I make it very clear in the piece, it's not that the Republicans have found some sort of a silver bullet or do anything particularly new or accurate. I mean, the, the, what they're doing now is the same crap I've been watching them do for the past 30, 35 years. Okay, so this shift towards the GOP is really not shift towards the GOP as much as it is a shift away from the Democratic Party, which is a very important distinction. It goes back to the last major realignment in American politics where Ronald Reagan, and I quote this in the piece, famously says, I didn't leave the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party left me. There are the fastest changing um, dynamic, again, in American politics is the consolidation of college educated people and non college educated people in different parties. College educated people going to the Democrats, non college educated going towards Republicans. We just talked about that. The most important thing to understand about that is those are two completely different cultures. The, the college educated uh, voter in America. Um, that is working in a high tech, high economy, um, you know, new economy job is much more optimistic about the future of America, much more optimistic about the future of their standing economically, much more comfortable with the with the changes in society that are occurring on everything from the demographic uh, grouping to LGBTQ issues. Uh, those that are non college educated working in traditional industries are much, much more pessimistic. They're seeing their industries in decline. They seem far fewer options economically. They rest and hold on to the cultural anchors that are much more traditional and don't like seeing the demographic or more progressive changes that are happening in society as a way of allowing them culturally to kind of hold on to their American identity. These are complete odds, and it's, it's directly correlates to whether or not you have a college degree. And so as a result, this tension has created this red-blue dynamic, which is almost 50-50 in this country, and it's really starting to tear apart this country at the seams. The argument that I make in this New York Times piece is that Latinos are the new fastest growing segment of the non-college voter uh, base, and we should not be surprised that they are behaving like non-college educated voters. Again, uh, and, I, and, I, and I call them out basically saying the Latino voters essentially the Reagan Democrat for almost essentially the same reasons. And the Democrats have the luxury of talking about these nuanced cultural 
gender and demographic issues, which in their view is changing or addressing the problems of tolerance or structural racism in the country, which are virtuous, but completely detached from the reality of working class people. And that's why I said earlier, the Democrats' biggest problem is they are completely alienated from working class people in this country. It's, it, and it, it, the, these, these derisive terms about cultural elitism, I think there's, there's a lot of truth to that, but it's not that Latinos are anti what they're saying, it's just alien to mm-hmm. them. It's like, what are you talking about? I don't know what Latinx is. And I point out the fact that 97% of Latinos don't use the term Latinx. Only 14%, according to Pew Research, only 14% of non-college educated Latinos have even heard of the term Latinx, while 9, 9% of progressive white college educated voters use the term regularly. So this is a term used by whites, progressive whites, highly educated whites to talk about the Latino community to address grievances or wrongs in a community that has never even heard the term. And they're literally speaking a different language, which is what I also point out in the piece. And it's this cultural divide tied to the education divide that is really hurting the Democrats because they're having conversations amongst themselves that are not even um, relevant to, to, to the Hispanic community generally. So since we're talking about it, uh, it's sort of a a somewhat related issue that you bring up. I do want to be culturally sensitive. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I do not feel the need to be overly deferential to those, um, I don't know, the gods and goddesses who determine, who, who, who seem to decide arbitrarily what words we can use and what words we can't. So as someone who's, who is a Latino, who has also researched uh, this matter, what, what is appropriate for monikers for me to use, Latino, Hispanic, what, what, uh, what's appropriate? Well, I think, for, let me just answer real quickly, Latino, Latino, there's no, there's no reason to change. Okay. Uh, so so you, you're not doing anything offensive by using language that we've always used. But you use interesting phraseology, which I, I love, and I'm going to steal this from you. The gods and goddesses that you're talking about are academics. Mm. This is academic, you know, weird speak <laughs> it, this, these are these are the conversations that are happening um on, on an academic campuses throughout the country and they're not terribly relevant to to the lives of working class people and again it gets back to this world and this cultural excess that is uh, that is allowed from these elites uh, in academic institutions and i'm not saying that derisively i'm saying that clinically as an observation to say we've got to reconcile these two where academia is actually doing things that is helpful in terms of resolving the equity that that um, exists rather than just finding this peculiar phraseology for it to, to to say we're somehow more woke or tolerant or comfortable and pretending like that is actually addressing societal problems because it's not so uh, don't don't seek to try to be anything more than what the community wants. And as a political communicator, the reason I don't like Latinx is because Latinos don't use it. Yeah. Uh, and so you talk to people where they're at. Right. You don't impose your values on them or try to change who they are for your benefit or your perceived slights. Talk to people and see what they want. And 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 you, as a communicator, again, your job is to talk to people. Um, where they are, not not where you think they should be. Well, I got way more than my money's worth today. So, and, and I, I know we only have a couple minutes left. I got to ask you, I'm seeing that painting in the back. Is that a Fabian Perez? Uh, the painting, oh, the, the oil behind me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I, I only saw the bottom of it. And I, one of my favorite artists is a guy named Fabian Perez. Uh, so, yeah. No, this is an oil. That's the actual, it's a, it, this is a hand painted oil. Uh, it's actually the um, oil that hangs over the, uh, in the, um, in the white house. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I had it reproduced for, for my office. I'm a big Lincoln uh, fan, of course, cause I'm from the Lincoln wing of the Republican party, but I also have my Frederick Douglass and Thaddeus Stevens portraits. Oh, wow. Who, who really, the three of them, the, these three, you know, people really defined what the Republican party was at its founding. Uh, Frederick Douglass, of course, very concerned about racial justice the mo- the, you know, and, and its fight and the fight for African-Americans, Blacks, slaves, and, and, and trying to help us as a country, as a people, 
be true to our dream of realizing what our founding was about. Thaddeus Stevens, who was the most uh, stringent abolitionist in the Republican Party, who demanded that um, even above the Constitution that there be equality amongst the races, and, and Lincoln, of course, who tried to reconcile all of these things, who stood for union first, even if slavery needed to be permitted, and was really much more of a, a practical politician to help this principled view of humanity come to pass. So I keep all three of them in my office. It's great. And it's great to remember the roots. I mean, especially now as the GOP is, um, has morphed into something that's just unrecognizable, yeah. at least the loudest voices in the GOP. Uh, so hopefully there's um, some, some deeper moorings that uh, can, can bring it back. And real quickly, I mean, I mean, you bring up a good point. A lot of people are asking me, why are you a Republican? Why, how can you still be a Republican? And, and the answer is exactly what you just articulated is this political party was the original Black Lives Matter movement, right? I mean, th this was literally, this was literally what we were founded on. And that, that matters to me, Those, that principle and that founding, whether the Republican party comes back or not, there needs to be a voice in the party that says, this is what the Republican party was founded on that spilled blood for and advocated for. And you may be deviating from that, but there is a, there are people of conscience who remain committed to the ideals, because if we do not have people that remain committed to the ideals of who we are, both as a founding of the country or the founding of a political party or the founding of a church or the founding of a religion or the founding of a corporation, you lose literally who you are. And it's, not a, it's not that I, I have this need to be some sort of a martyr, but I think it is important that we remember that principle does matter, especially in public life. And that's kind of why I've, I've remained to be the voice uh, in this party, even if I may be one of the last or the last one. <laughs> yeah. Last man standing. Last man standing. Last question is, do you have any questions for me? Um, boy, I've got a lot of questions for you. We've got to have you actually on our podcast to talk about just kind of what's gone on and uh, I, just a million media questions. Most of my questions for you, though, I think would be would be more personal. Um, I, and I, well, I, I, you're so good at this, Corey. And I love I love what you're doing with the podcast. I want to ask if candidly what you enjoy the most about it. Oh, there's so much I enjoy. I, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is just the human connection. The, what's special about this? I can, I can you hear my dog? Speaking of human, speaking of human connections. <laughs> yeah, that's just a. <laughs> human or, or canine moment, but um, is this, this medium really lends itself to more nuanced conversations and getting to know folks at a deeper level. Um, sorry, my, my, my youngest is, is picking up Charlie. There you go. Um, you know, we can have more detailed conversations, you know, but the other part of it too is just in the preparation for a conversation, I, I don't want you to come in here and, and waste your time. So I get to read up on all of Mike Madrid's latest pieces and listen to his podcasts and get to know Chuck, uh, somebody so interesting and accomplished like Chuck Rocha, uh, reading his book, Tio Bernie. Um, it, it's just, I love it all, man. But even, even the stuff that's part of this, that's mundane, I enjoy that too. You know, like when I was doing theater, I would tell people, I don't care if I'm acting, writing, directing, or cleaning the toilets. Cause I used to, uh, there, there were some 99 seat spaces where I, I had to do that all. And yeah. I didn't mind cleaning the toilets because it was all, it was all like in the, in the church, we have this expression being a part of the body of Christ. It's mm -hmm. all just one piece of bringing great stories to life. So if I'm doing the post-production and editing, if I'm prepping, if I'm doing the interviews, or, or learning, a, we're on TikTok, so I'm learning a new social media platform. I love it all because it's bringing principled, interesting, fun voices mm. to, to a, a new set of ears, a, yeah. a new audience. So I love it all, man. I love what you're doing. And I love the energy that you bring. And uh, ever since we started talking, when I was you know working on the Lincoln Project stuff, I was like, this guy's, this guy's tapping into something. So I'm glad, you know, you know, Ron Steslow has become a friend of yours and now yeah. Chuck and, and just the network you're building is really impressive. And um, I, I love what you do. Love what you're doing, man. So keep up at it. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate, again, just you introducing us to Chuck. Uh, what a great conversation. So how can we find uh, the Latino vote uh, and all the rest of the great work that you're doing? 
yeah uh check us out at the latino vote podcast uh which is at the latino underscore vote and you can follow me on twitter at madrid underscore mike always some great stuff you're you're a great follow in fact i, I think I, I caught a couple of things just this morning that a couple of threads that you retweeted that uh, were very, very thought provoking and articles that you share and just some of the, some of your own takes are always great. So thanks again, Mike. I really, it's great. It's great hanging out with you. I got to buy you a beer, man. We got to do this in person. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be down there quite a bit this year in Southern California, just because of things that are going on. I'd love to just kind of hang out a little bit more socially, but also uh, 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 come back on the program sometime too. And we'll talk about some of the issues of the day. I just love doing it with you. That's great. That's great. Thanks. Thanks again. And as always, if you dig what we're doing here, please hit that subscribe button, leave a review and comments wherever you get your podcasts and tell a friend about TPNR and all the great guests we have. It's easier than ever to recommend politics and religion. Us. That's politics and religion. Us. You can even support our program through the patron app on our site. Now go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week. Thank you for joining us today. If you dig what we're doing here, it is super easy to follow us. You can go to our site, politicsandreligion.us. That's with the and spelled out, A-N-D. Politicsandreligion.us. And we're on all the socials, at TP and R pod. You know, TP and R pod for talking politics and religion pod. And here's a big way you can support us, by becoming one of our patrons. You can even become a producer or executive producer of our program and have a lot more say in who we bring on, the kinds of questions we explore, or just help us keep the lights on. But mostly, we really appreciate you giving us a listen. So for the whole team here at Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be back in a few days to do our little part in Tikkun Olam.